It was a great Bible school. I enjoyed that so much. I've been through a lot of those. And this one ran as well as any I have ever seen in my life. And uh, we had a good time. I'm going to tell this because it's funny. I was up in the pastor's study and I was doing the salvation presentation. Sitting behind the desk, y'all saw me there. Had my little visual aid thing going here, you know, where I mix my little chemicals, do the Bill Nye Science Guy type thing, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Griffin walks in. He says, this reminds me of the principal's office. <laughs> and I said, how do you know what the inside? He goes, <laughs> I know, it's kind of like going to see the principal. Yeah, okay. I get that. I really do. We had a great time, though, and I thank God for every person who worked. Bible schools can't happen without workers. And uh, we, had a, we had a glorious outpouring of that. And we had a really wonderful group of kids. And I enjoyed them very much. We got a lot of neck hugs and all kinds of stuff like that. I just like that. It's just wonderful. <coughs> Turn with me to Mark's Gospel, the fifth chapter. And Mark's Gospel records more miracles of Jesus than any of the other Gospels do. And we're kind of investigating some of the miracles of the Lord, see where that takes us. <coughs> In the fifth chapter of Mark's gospel, you find basically three miracles taking place. One, the first one, is that a demon-possessed man is healed. <clears throat> On the heels of that miracle, uh, word had come to Jesus, a man by the name of Jairus, who was the ruler of the synagogue, sent to him and said, my, my daughter is dying. Can you come? And as Jesus was on his way to the home of Jairus to, to uh, deal with that emergency, another miracle takes place on the way. And this is the miracle of the woman who had the issue of blood, who reached out and touched the garment of Jesus, and she was healed. And there's a lot here to this that would really, I think, bless our hearts because, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about this. I know a lot of people who need a touch from the Lord. How about you? Uh, you know, and, and folks, a touch from the Master makes such a big difference in the lives of people. It can actually change the entire uh, direction of, of a person's life. It can really, really change things. <clears throat> so we're going to read verses 25 to 34 this morning, and we'll see where the Lord takes us in this. Now there was a certain woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things uh, from many physicians and she had spent all she had and was no better but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garments. For she said, if I only may touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out from him, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, You see the multitude thronging you, and you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And Jesus said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Be healed of your affliction. <clears throat> Let's talk about the woman for a moment. This woman had an issue of blood, and she had had that for 12 years' time. Now, you stop and think about that. A 12-year period of time seems like a long period of time to us, but what if your average life expectancy was somewhere between 36 years to 40 years, which that's where it was at the time that Jesus lived. 
And so for maybe a third of her life, maybe even more, she had had this constant issue of blood coming from her. And she had done everything in the world she could to take care of that, but nothing had availed. And that brought about, about some things in her life. She was diseased. And I'm certain, don't you know that, you know how people are, because the truth of the matter is, folks, people haven't changed a whole lot over the course of time. They really, they really still do the same things they've always done. And I'm certain that when she came out of her house and walked down the street that people were saying, there she is. That's that woman that's got that problem, you know. And uh, because she has that problem, we're not going to associate with her. Because let me tell you, according to Mosaic law, because of what she had, she could not worship. She couldn't go to the temple. She couldn't go to the synagogue because she was declared, because of the issue of blood that she had, she was declared ceremonially unclean. Therefore, she could not come to a place of worship like this and worship with other people. And, and she was almost, not quite, but almost on the same level as a, as a leper because I am certain that she was probably ostracized because of what she had. Well, she's unclean. Uh, we can't be around her lest we become ceremonially unclean as well. So we will, and I can't say ceremonially today. Have you all noticed that? It's, it's the heat. I'm, I'm blaming it on the heat. But she was separated from people. Uh, more than likely, she was separated from friends, obviously. She couldn't have friendships. Uh, she was separated most likely from her family. It could be that they had a separate place for her to stay rather than her being in the house with her family because she was of, of that unclean nature according to the law. And not only that, but the Bible says that she had taken and spent everything that she had on doctors. Now that's one thing that has not changed through the years. You can still spend everything you have on doctors. And the bottom line was this, and it had done her no good. In fact, she wasn't better. The Bible says that she was worse. And can you imagine having to suffer through some of the things that I'm certain they did in medicine in those days? You know, up until the early part of the 20th century, they thought that bloodletting was something that would make people better. In fact, I had a step-grandfather that was the only grandpa that I actually knew, and I loved him with all my heart. But his first wife, the lady that he had married first in his life, died because a doctor did bloodletting on her and bled her too much. And she bled to death while the doctor was holding a pan under her wrist. Uh, and he said, well, obviously that didn't work. And can you imagine some of the stuff I was thinking about this morning, some of the stuff my mama used to give me for medicine? Now, I know I'm talking to some people who understand what I'm talking about. I thought, sure, she was trying to kill me when I was a kid. And I've, I've taken everything in the world from kerosene and a spoonful of sugar. And I never could figure out what the kerosene was for. But anyway, I guess it was good for me. And so she always looked at me and she'd hand me stuff and she'd say, this will purify your blood, son. Okay, I'd take it. Well, <laughs> I survived it. If you survived childhood and the time I was growing up, you were doing pretty good. She had been through so many things, and she was destitute because she had spent everything in the world she had trying to get better. And you know what? All of these things that we've just enumerated lead us to a place of desperation. And uh, a lot of people know what it's like to come to a police place of desperation in your life, no matter what it is that has driven you there. But I've got some good news for you because the Lord specializes in human desperation. In fact, some of the best things that God can do in your life are in times when you have given up hope that you don't think anything in the world is going to help, that everything has fallen through and everything is falling apart and life just can't have any meaning from this point forward, God has a way of moving in in moments and times like that to bring some of his best blessings into our lives. 
and he does. Uh, you know, I've, uh, I've been there a few times, and, you know, I've, I've said this, this to the Lord, and I'm sure some of you have too. Lord, I just give up. And I've never audibly heard the voice of God in my ears, but I've heard his voice in my heart before, and I've heard him say stuff like this. Well, John, it's about time. It's about time you gave up. It's about time you came to the place where you can't do anything about this. It's about time you realize that the only help and the only hope that you have is in me. And so this woman hears about the fact that Jesus is going to be passing nearby. And she makes up her mind, if I can just go and maybe work my way through the crowd and touch the very hem of his garment, I believe that I can be made whole. Now, you got, you got to understand the, the problem with that, too. Culturally, the Middle East is different than us. Uh, here, you know, if you'll notice, when I, when I speak with you, I speak at you from an arm's distance. I'm one of those kind of people that really doesn't like people who get up in my face. Am, 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 I, am I preaching to folks who understand that? I don't like that very much. I don't like being backed into corners and stuff like that. And, but you go to the Middle East, and one of the things you find is that those folks don't have any concept of space whatsoever. In fact, I was just staying in a hotel in Jerusalem, and we had a whole bunch of South Koreans there. And uh, they don't know anything about that either, okay? And so me and my buddy Schroeder, we were on the elevator. Here we are, big old strapping Arkansas boys, and about 492 South Koreans get on this elevator with us. And they're all just about this tall. And they're all looking at us grinning, okay? In fact, at that time, I had a long white beard, you know, Santa Claus type beard. And every one of them I ran into wanted their picture made with me. I guarantee you my picture's all over Seoul, Korea right now. But uh, they were on there, and I just looked at old Schroeder, and I said, Schroeder, have you ever seen so many foreigners in one spot in your life? And they were just all grinning, oh, you know. But we went the next day to the old city of Jerusalem. The old city of Jerusalem, the streets are barely as wide as one of these pews is long. There are no vehicles allowed in the old city, in the old walled part of the city, and it's all pedestrian traffic. But let me tell you something. Those folks know how to congest the street. They know how to pile out in there. There was one little Arab woman coming down through there. She had a newspaper rolled up, and she was swatting everything that got in front of her, and I got in front of her. <laughs> and, and so she hit me, and I just did the old Arkansas thing. I looked at her and said, well, bless your heart. <laughs> you know, that can mean anything in Arkansas. This crowd that was around Jesus, in fact, the disciples made reference to that. Uh, how, why are you asking who touched you? Don't you see this crowd that is thronging around you? I mean, they were just working like bees, folks. They were all around him, all over him. And they knew nothing of space. They were just crowded in next to him as tightly as they could. And this woman said, if I can just get in there. If I can find some way to work my way through that crowd and be able to just reach out and touch the very hem of his garment, I believe that I would be made whole. Now, where did she get that? Where did that come from? You know, there's a scriptural precedent for that. It's over in the book of Malachi, chapter 4 and verse 2. And listen to this verse. But to you who fear my name the son of righteousness will arise with healing in his wings. And you shall go out and grow fat like stall-fed calves. Well, I did that part of it anyway. Healing in his wings. You know what the outer hymns of a, of a biblical robe are called? Wings. They're the wings of the garment. And this woman is saying, in fact, it, it kind of gives me the idea that this woman knew the scriptures. She was probably educated. She may have been an individual who was literate, which most women weren't in those days, but she probably was one maybe who had read this for herself. But she said, huh, 
Malachi said that there's going to be one coming, the son of righteousness, with healing in his wings. And if I can just reach out and touch the wings, the hem of his garment, I believe I'll be made whole. And you know, here's what she did. First, she trusted. You know, you have to trust, don't you? And trust means taking your hands completely off everything and trusting. I did an illustration with the kids up in the pastor's study yesterday. Uh, behind the desk there is a real nice office chair, okay? And uh, it just fit me, by the way. It was nice. You know, I just kind of settled down in there. If I hadn't been coming in and out, I think I could have napped right there. But I told the kids, I, I, every, with every group, I would stand up and I'd say, all right, I'm a pretty good-sized feller, right? And most of them would be going, uh-huh. Y'all go ahead and laugh, okay? And I say, you know what I did this morning? I came in here. And I looked at that chair and I said, boy, that's a nice chair. That's a good chair. I like that chair. It looks like a good, strong chair. And with me, that's faith. Okay? And I said, and I turned the chair all around and I said, you know what? That is a great chair. I believe that chair can hold me. But you know what, folks? That's not faith yet. That's not trusting yet. The yet, now I'm going to do this, okay, is when you put your weight on it. Amen? Amen? That's faith. That's trusting. She was willing to trust Christ to the point that she was going to stick her proverbial neck out and go into this crowd and touch the hem of his garment because she was convinced that Christ could and Christ would heal her. You know, here's the thing. I have never seen God say no to someone who came asking. Now, he may not answer exactly the way that I ask him to answer. You know, there have been people that I have loved who have been sick who did not recover. But I also understand this, that God has a plan better than my plan, and God has a way better than my way, and I've learned to trust in that because one thing I do know is that Jesus loves me, and that God loves me, and that God has a plan for me. And if God allows it to come across the threshold of my life, then obviously He intends me to grow somehow thereby. So, I've learned to trust him. And she's saying, I'm going to trust him to the point that I'm going to push my way through this crowd, and I'm certain that was a monumental undertaking on her part. She was a sickly woman. She was pushing her way through a crowd of, of men who were thronged around Jesus, and she worked her way up there, and then she did this. She touched him. She trusted him first, and then touched him and you notice what happened the scripture says there in let's see which verse is it uh, and immediately that's verse 30 immediately immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out from him he turned around in the crowd and said who touched me when the Lord does stuff he does a lot of stuff immediately. You know how long it took him to save me? Just about like that. Because I was lost, and then I was saved. And the grace of God did that. And you know, I read all the way through the Gospels how Jesus healed people, and how he brought things to pass. And uh, you see this word immediately a lot in the Gospels. That as Jesus spoke to an unclean spirit, immediately it came out. As Jesus ministered to a blind man, immediately he could see. As Jesus spoke to a cripple, immediately strength came in their limbs and they stood. I was at church camp a number of years ago. And I was watching this young man 
who was out there walking around campus. He was, he was a sweet young man, had a beautiful spirit about him, just one of those kids you just like. But I noticed he was walking straight into trees. And I walked over to him. I said, son, are you all right? Because he just, he just plastered a big old pin oak tree. I mean, just poof, right in the face, you know. And I'm going, something not right here, you know. And I said, are you okay? He said, yeah. He said, you know, I used to be blind. And I did the good old Arkansas thing. I said, do what? He said, yeah, I used to be blind. But he said, my uncle took me to see this particular evangelist. And he said, he healed me. I'm just waiting to get my sight. And I'm sitting here going, no. That's not the way this works. I don't think so, son. You know, and, and uh, he said, yeah, that, that man healed me. It just hadn't come to fruition yet. I'm going, excuse me. But when Jesus heals, he heals. When God does what he does, he does. And immediately this woman knew. First of all, the issue of blood stopped. It stopped. Twelve years. A big chunk of this woman's life. She had dealt with this and she had not gotten better. She had gotten worse. Can you imagine the weakness that this woman experienced? Can you imagine just how tired not only her body must have been, but how tired her spirit must have been, how tired her emotions must have been, putting up with this day in and day out and day in and day out with no end in sight. And she touched the hem of the one who is risen with healing in his wings. And immediately. My hair standing up. Can you all see it? I want to tell you, folks, when God does something, he does it amazingly well. And she knew in her body that she had been healed. Don't you know that she felt completely different? Maybe she felt the way she had felt 12 years prior before this illness ever came upon her. And she's going, wow. Look at this. Look at what Jesus has done. And Jesus turned around. I want to point out something. The, the question that Jesus asked is, who touched me? He was not asking for information. God does not need our information. Uh, when I go to him in prayer, uh, he may want me to enumerate some things, but it's not for in the purpose of informing God. God already knows. He does. He understands. He feels. He senses. He knows what's going on. And uh, you know why he wants us to, to mention it? So we, he'll understand that we know what's going on. He says to this woman who touched me, you know what she needed to do? I talked to the kids about this yesterday. Not only did she need to believe, but she needed to confess what Jesus had done to her. I mean, who wants to have, have a wonderful thing like this healing take place and not tell anybody about it? She was afraid. You know who makes you afraid? Satan does. Uh, God doesn't have anything to do with fear. What, is, what does the scripture tell us? The, the perfect love casts out how much fear? All fear. Gets rid of it. You know, boldness. I, I was telling the kids about when I first got saved. You know, I was 12 years old. I was in training union. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good term from days gone by. <clears throat> I was in this class. The teacher happened to be the high school principal in Amity, who was also my cousin. And she was a wonderful, wonderful lady of God. And I remember she looked right straight at me. She had the darkest brown eyes you ever saw in your life. And 
It was like she was looking through me and she said, have you ever trusted Jesus as your savior? And I said, and the Lord, boy, the spirit had been dealing with me anyway. And I said, no. She said, would you like to tonight? And I said, yes. And I mean, I got on my knees. That old basement floor was covered in water because it had been flooding and raining. And we didn't have a French drain around it at that time. Water was standing about an inch deep in that old basement floor. And I got down on my knees. And I said, my mama's going to kill me for getting my britches wet. <laughs> and I asked Jesus to save me. And you know what happened at that moment? He did. He just did. I didn't, you know, I couldn't even spell theology. But I knew that I was lost. And I knew that I needed Jesus. And I didn't know how to go through all, all these things. People say, well, did you say the right things when you prayed? The Bible doesn't even say you have to pray. The Bible says, with the heart man believes unto righteousness. With the mouth confession is made to salvation. And so, I believed that day. I came out of that room and I remember the training union director was my cousin's husband. Floyd. I went in there and I said, Floyd, I just trusted Jesus as my Savior. Man, he grabbed me, broke down in tears, loving on me. I ran upstairs and there was my mama. I said, the first thing she did was look at my britches. <laughs> and that, and that's the way mamas are. I said, Mama, I just got saved. Well, there was hallelujah, and then you know what? At the end of the service, I, I shared that with everybody there, and I remember all these people who came by and hugged my neck, old Ted and Clara and Bill and May and Jimmy and Sue and all these people that I grew up knowing and, and loving, loved on me and shared Jesus with me and cared about me, and I trusted Jesus, and the first thing I wanted to do was let people know that I had. Share that. Confess it. I got home, I called my school teachers. You know, some of them said, you got saved? Thank God. <laughs> I knew what the inside of the principal's office looked like too. <laughs> oh, I called my uncles. I called, I called my mother's oldest brother. And it was his birthday when I got saved, August 6th. And he just started weeping. He said, Bud, I've been praying for that today, for you to come to know Jesus. She confessed. I just believed that if I could touch the wings, the hem of your garment, I would be made whole. And sure enough, sure enough, all the stigma is gone. All the embarrassment is gone. All the pain and the weakness and all the other things associated with this were gone because there's something about when God touches a person's life, old things pass away, all things become new. And she trusted him. He said, who touched me? That's his requirement. Confess me. You know, I, I talked to a fellow one time and said, well, you know, I'm, I'm a Christian, but I just don't let anybody know about it. And I go, do what? <laughs> I don't get that. Well, I just believe that's a personal thing. Well, that's a lie from the pit. Yeah, that's personal, but it's public. It's for public consumption. <laughs> And, you know, look at what Jesus did. When she confessed all of this and said all that to him, the first word out of his mouth was, daughter. Isn't that precious? It shows relationship. He might have, before this, he might have called her woman, because that was common. But here he calls her Daughter, and you know what that means? That something bigger than the physical healing took place. We're going to meet this woman in heaven. Because not only was her body changed, her heart was changed. Daughter. 
your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your, of your affliction. That's his reward. Go in peace. Don't be troubled by this anymore. You know, I'm so glad. Isn't it wonderful that the Lord can touch the hearts and lives of people and they can walk away and leave all that stuff behind that was behind them? You know what? There's not a person here this morning that is beyond the reach of God's grace. There's not a person here this morning that Jesus didn't die for. There's not a person here this morning that God does not love with all of his big old heart. And you know what? He wants to put all the stuff behind you and allow you to be able to walk away with that with a new life. A new life and a new reason for being. For those of us who know him and, and have a relationship with him, he wants us to confess that before men. He wants us to tell people, hey, the best thing in my life that ever happened to me is this. You know, we'll show off everything in the world. I remember when I got my first car, uh, somebody, you know, on Facebook, they'll put this. How, how much did your first car cost? $795. Yeah. I drove the hound dog out of that old car. Sold it for $795. <laughs> it was a good old car. But you know what I did? Now, if you're familiar with Amity, we've got a squircle. It's not really a square, and it's not really a circle. It's a squircle. Some people call that a roundabout. I say, no. Hmm. Roundabout's what they have in the city that doesn't make any sense. I said, we got a squircle that's been there for a hundred and some odd years. And... I took it uptown where all my buddies were hanging out, sitting on the hoods of their cars, and I pulled up there because I guarantee you there was more shiny metal in the front bumper of that 64 Ford than there is in a whole car now. I pulled up there and honked, had my eight track tape player in, uh huh, yeah, had my windows rolled down, won't go for a ride. That consisted of three times around the square. I was proud of it. I was showing it off. I wanted everybody to know I had a new car. You know, people do all kinds of things like that. Hey, look at my new dress. Look at my new shirt. Look at my, new, you know, ladies will go, look at my new ring. You know, heard about a bus driver one time. Girl kept getting on his bus with her hand up like that. She had a new engagement ring. One day he had a new pair of shoes, so he went around with his foot up on the dashboard. <laughs> we want people to know. Why won't we tell them about Jesus? Jesus is the answer. I, I don't know how to fix what's wrong in people's lives. I really don't. I counsel people all the time. I've got active counseling sessions going right now. and <laughs> Retired, and I'm still doing it, you know. Uh, but the one thing that I can do is point them to the one who can. That's it. Uh, Everybody knows somebody like this. Maybe not identically, maybe, maybe not with the same thing she had, but everybody knows somebody that needs a touch from the master. Everybody knows somebody whose life needs to be changed. And you know what we get to do? We get to tell them. We get to share with them. My friend Rick Engel used to take groups every year to the Holy Land, and his tour included going over into Jordan to the fabled city of Petra. And the only way to get into Petra was is really to ride a donkey or a, or a camel through this very, very narrow little canyon that gets about as narrow as this aisle right here. And, and uh, so they, he would hire this same Arab man to guide his groups into the city of Petra every year. And every year, Rick Engel would sit down with him and witness to him about Christ. And finally, they went over there, and, and Rick asked him, he said, so tell me, 
have you trusted Christ as your Savior yet? And he goes, Rick, I want to know, why do you keep asking me? Why have I trusted this Jesus? And Rick said, well, I know that Jesus is the answer. I know he's the way, the truth, and the life. And you know, I would be cheating you so badly if I did not tell you what I know about who Jesus is. And this man's face lit up. He said, oh, I understand now. You don't want to be guilty of the sin of the desert. And Rick goes, okay, I'm, I'm lost now. What's the sin of the desert? He said, it's knowing where the water is and not telling anybody. What do you think this woman did? Let's, let's just do a little conjecture here. I believe she went around telling everybody what Jesus had done for her. And I thought, I was thinking, you know, she'd be out walking on the street and people would say, hey, what, 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 weren't you sick? Yeah, I was. The operative word is was. See, I met this man, Jesus, and I touched the hem of his garment and he made everything well. And my life's totally different now. I think that's what we need to do. Because if you're saved today, folks, you've been, you've been the recipient of a touch from the master. You've been blessed. You have. And you know, I've got good news for you today. Oh, do I have some good news for you today. If you're here today and you're struggling through that, whatever it might be, I know the one. I know the one who can answer that for you. I'm not him, but I know him because he's been all that and more to me. Ladies and gentlemen here this morning, let's get real with God. This woman knew she was desperate. She knew she needed help and she had tried everything in the world and it did not help anything one bit. But then Jesus passed by. I'm telling you, Jesus is passing by this morning. And you know what? If you'll reach out and touch him, <coughs> he will change your life. He not only can, if you have the faith enough to do it, he will. I promise. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for this story this morning of this woman who was so desperate but found in Christ everything that she needed. Oh Lord, I'm certain in this room there are people who are struggling with things, dealing with issues, maybe even dealing with the fact that they are lost and don't know you. And Lord, this morning, I pray that you'll convince them by your Holy Spirit that they can trust you. And just by trusting and reaching out, they can receive what their soul desires so much. Lord God, I pray this morning you'll speak to hearts and draw us to yourself. Let's not worry about what people say, what people think, what people might come up with. Lord, it's just us and you here this morning. And I pray that you'll speak and move and touch hearts and touch lives and change lives and help those of us who do know you, Father, who have been the recipients of such amazing grace from you. Help us to confess before men the real joy of having the one who is the son of righteousness with healing in his wings, touch your life. Lord, may it be so here this morning, and may you receive the glory and the praise. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Let's stand together, please.